Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. All right, so for today's episode, I want to talk about robots and golems. All right, so I want to start off by digging into a little bit of backstory on where robots come from in our stories. But before we, and then I want to get into some, maybe some more modern ones, some that stick out in my mind, uh, and and where in the world golems connect to all this. But I should first clarify a distinction I think is worth making in my mind. I don't want to talk about, in this episode the like the mother brain uh artificial intelligence super godlike intelligent robot uh a couple that i have in mind when i'm talking about those types are like uh hal from uh, 2001 space odyssey arthur c clark um or say in uh, harlan ellison's i have no mouth and i must scream am or am um that kind of robot uh you know, the others, there are others, I don't know, Skynet even maybe would fall under that one. I think that is a, a slightly different type of story uh, and a different kind of archetype of monster. And so we'll save that one for another episode. The ones I'm talking about now are those robots that are like physically metal men or in one of my favorite cases, a uh, woman in which these things are created as pure servants or created as um, uh, underlings of some type or another by humans. And then they turn, rise up and kill their creators and masters or uh, fight back against them in one way or another. I think that's the same kind of a general plot that keeps playing out over and over again. And a whole lot of our robot stories and golem stories. So first about the robots, and then we'll get into how golems connect to those. The term robot is um, started in 1920, early 1920s. I think it was 1921 when the play came out. There was a play uh, by a guy named Carl Kapek, or Kapek, I don't know how you say his name. And it was Rossum's Universal Robots. He essentially invented that word robot. Um, This play was, uh, he was a Czech writer. This play first debuted in Prague. So it was considered a Prague play. We're going to see that connection to golems a little bit later. Um, And there's a Czech word robotnik, which essentially meant slave or like servant, like forced servant, as in this pure underling kind of machine like human being. Uh, so, so essentially a slave, I guess, is the, is the best translation for it. And a shortened Robotnik would end up being just robot. That's not that Robotnik is not the same, by the way, of, as robotics. I'm saying two different things there. Robotics, by the way, was uh, co- or created by Isaac Asimov uh, years later, specifically for his book, which is a collection of short stories uh, called I, Robot. We'll get to him and, and his three laws of robotics in a little bit. Um, but this robot idea, this play, um, essentially was about this this like inventor and this like factory mogul who created these uh, mechanical men and in the play they would wear these big like tin suits not looking too unlike the tin man and wizard of oz or something like that or like the early um the early robot in the in the 1920 something film what 1920s yeah the 1920 film i think with harry houdini by the way harry houdini was the first man on film uh to fight a robot he was one of these uh these edison uh films in which you uh this was harry houdini playing essentially himself it was called master of mysteries or master of mystery 
yeah i think that's what it was um and he would uh and, and if i remember correctly he was trying to like break in to some nationally secured vault of secrets or something anyway the guard was this robot and it's like the least it's the least worrisome robot you might ever see on film it's just kind of cute and looks entirely immobile essentially is and he kind of just points and directs uh the henchman um to like stop harry houdini it's all silent film stuff um oh where was i Oh, about the, okay, so the play, the R-U-R, um, yeah, and so the, and so this original play that coined the term robot, you had these mechanical men working as slaves in this factory, uh, and, and, and as they worked, they weren't all that efficient, and so the inventor got this idea, let's add human emotion to them so that they can find pride in their work and maybe be better workers. And in the early 1920s, you can already see, especially in, in Czechoslovakia, um, that uh, the connection, of course, between the 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 labor revolutions at the time and what he's saying in this play. And so as soon as they add a little bit of human to these mechanical men, then they band together, rise up and slaughter uh, all the humans. And then they save one last guy, the only kind of uh, mechanic who was nice to them and kept trying to take care of them. They give him the what is it, the dubious honor of being killed last. So I think it's pretty cool that even in the earliest robot story, that's officially robot story, he created the word robot, the plot's still the same. We create these slaves, these mechanical slaves, to do our bidding, whatever that is. And then for one reason or another, normally our screw up, they rise up against us and take us down. Now, you could say uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was a much earlier robot story, and I think that would make uh, some sense. Um, I talked about Frankenstein in one of the earliest episodes of this, Monsters and Literature. I think uh, the, I think Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is one of the one of the absolutely fundamental pieces of literature. If we're just going to look at monsters in literature itself, um, but. I want to I want to save a Frankenstein conversation. Frankenstein and his creation deserve its uh, uh, their own episode, all dedicated to them. So that's a future one as well. Um, but it's worth mentioning, though, the year before uh, Mary Shelley, I should I should call her Mary uh, Willenscraft Godwin. At that time, she wasn't yet officially Mary Shelley. Um, the year before she wrote Frankenstein, she actually went uh, to one of these automaton showings. Now, automatons were really hot in the in the what late seventeen hundreds through the eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. They were essentially these movable dolls, and sometimes built or engineered. We had almost want to say programmed these days uh, to perform a single task, and. Uh, so they would be, I don't know, gear, they wouldn't be like full on robots as, as we might see them as like essentially kind of autonomous. They're more like, um, anthropomorphized, um, gadgets. I would say that would just like sit there, um, like a, not too unlike a cuckoo clock, except this one just happens to look like a little girl at the table, uh, writing a note. That was one of them that was on display at this time. Uh, they were, it was, uh, it was one of these, uh, venues at Neuchâtel or however it's pronounced. There was this automaton inventor named Jacquette Duros. I have no idea how to pronounce that name correctly. So I'll just follow the classic, uh, um, William Strunk advice. When you don't know how to pronounce a word, say it loudly. When you don't know how to pronounce a word, say it loudly. <laughs> Uh, uh, E.B. White uh, famously <laughs> wrote down that that's how he was in class. He would like bang the the uh, lectern and scream that at everybody. Uh, so I'll just say this inventor was his name was pronounced Jacques <laughs> Andrews, and he invented uh, some of these that you might have seen like different images of. Oh, there was a um, 
recent book turned into a movie. Hugo. That's what it was. Hugo. Uh, I think Martin Scorsese turned that into a movie that got really popular. And you see these like little automatons that would draw out or write things once you set the gears in motion. Um, those are kind of references to his inventions. There was like a famous one of this young lady playing the harpsichord or it looked like that. I think his most, most famous one was this little, little tiny baby doll at this little desk and she would draw out or write these notes and he was actually arrested at one point um, and accused of sorcery after one of these shows people saw these things happening and they were so amazed and terrified at these non-human beings having these human interactions <laughs> he was arrested for sorcery long long I mean we're talking about early 1800s so long after the witch hunts had died out he was one of the last and one of the earliest robot inventors um, so Mary Shelley went and saw one of these things wrote about how fascinating it was in her journal entries and then the very next year wrote Frankenstein I think there's a clear connection there and it's pretty cool so we could say that Frankenstein inspired a lot of robot stories or we could say robots inspired Frankenstein um, I guess whichever way you you want to look at it okay so uh, what does all of what does all of that stuff have to do with golems and like what are golems well, Gollum is this is this monster out of Jewish folklore that is carved out of clay, and then using uh, Jewish mysticism techniques, uh, specifically Kabbalistic techniques, such as using words of power, either written on a note and placed in his mouth, or carved into his forehead, or something like that. Um, this golem could be brought to life in order to do tasks. Now, why you would want to bring him to life or what tasks he's going to do it completely changes from one story to the next. Uh, it wasn't these, these golem stories weren't, um, really recorded as stories until you get into the 1800s. Although the most famous of them, the golem of Prague, uh, was set at about 1600 and there's some much earlier kind of mentions of Gollum recipes in earlier Jewish mysticism writings and Kabbalistic writings but I think the whole thing kind of, kind of came together much later so this this big it normally would be this big bulky strong kind of brainless slave essentially a mechanical slave but this one made out of clay and magically animated um, he would be sent out to do very simple tasks now some of them might be like um it's you it's a you can't do labor on the sabbath right but you still have work that needs to be done so you create a golem to do that labor for you actually there's a there's a really uh, cool modern version of it of that story except this one's set at an appalachian farm uh by pinkney benedict um so uh sometimes these golems would be created just to do labor that's just too hard on the people who create them to do it themselves uh the the most famous of the the Gollum stories, the Gollum of Prague, he was created to defend the Jews of Prague. They were being persecuted, as they always tend to be, and um, and in this case, some they were like accused of like stealing children and draining them of their blood for their evil magical rituals, or other versions go that uh, that um, the Holy Roman Emperor uh, of the Holy Roman Empire, which is neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, as, uh, who was a Jacques Barzun once said of it. Um, the uh, the Holy Roman Emperor was about to um, kick all the Jews out of Prague yet again. And so for one reason or another, they needed kind of a superhero defender. Well, this, this Jewish philosopher and mystic, uh, he was an, actually an historical one, and he's pretty important in, um, in I would say, the, the history of Jewish philosophy and theology. Uh, He's known. God, I don't remember his name, uh, but he was he was called the Maharal of Prague. And that was this uh, like 
he's he's the awesome he's like the rabbi of Prague um is it, it stood for something like that like the master rabbi of Prague some anyway the story goes that he made this golem, uh, brought it to life, and then uh, made sure to um, uh, unanimate it, not necessarily kill it off because it was never truly alive, uh, but he would deanimate this thing um, right before the Sabbath every week, except one week he forgot. And the monster went out and like was was uh, breaking the Sabbath and he had to go stop him. Other versions of it gets a lot more brutal. Um, one version of it, he's going around like slaughtering people uh, because he was given a, an order a little bit too vague to like protect and defend. And he interpreted that as like ripping people's limbs off and, and killing the, the, the attackers and these kinds of things. Um, and so it almost always ends up with the creator just having to go out and fight his creation and just barely surviving and then uh, the destruction of this thing that became too much for him to handle um, within the golem story you get this big lumbering clunky slow-footed creation that is extremely hard to kill and for one reason or another is inclined to like fight back and kill uh, human beings and so you've got to find some way to stop this thing that you have made or one of your own kind has made and that ends up being essentially the same kind of robot story we see again and again now what are the odds of for a long time the golem story being so famous uh, the Gollum story out of Prague being so famous, and then uh, the play that creates robots and the modern robot story also coming out of Prague. Probably not a coincidence. I think these two stories are deeply intertwined. You could say, well, technically they're kind of different because one's mechanical and another one's magical and clay. Um, like the cl creating a man out of clay and animating him, it was it was the lesser version of Adam or Adam, right? Like the red mud of Eden was formed together in the shape of a man and then Yahweh breathed life into its nostrils and came it came to life and the most the wisest among us can do is to do like a, a shoddy version of that um uh, my favorite way uh, that the golem is animated, by the way, in all the folklore is where they carve in uh, the Hebrew word uh, am or emet, uh, which essentially means truth. And that brings him to life. They would like carve it into his forehead, sometimes into his tongue. And he would that would bring him to life. And a lot of these stories, he had, didn't have the ability to speak because the ability to speak was the the, tr the sign of true life in the golem is always a type of uh, false life uh, or fraudulent life, uh, you know, contrived and created and not not true life. And so he couldn't speak. But in other versions of it, he could speak. One of them, I think, he even fell in love and then goes on a rampage when he's uh, when it's unrequited. Um, and so the uh, the way you animate them is you carve in the Hebrew word for truth emet, and then you deanimate him uh, by. Uh, erasing or blotting out the beginning of that word. And so it just says met, which means death. And so you take him from truth and he's animated to death and he just stands there like a statue. And so those, so other than the mechanics of how it works, like one supposedly works on gears and electricity and another one kind of works on clay and magic and other than that, they're essentially the same kind of story. And I think a really fascinating one too. One that's more and more popular as we get pushed more into the modern era. And I don't think it's just because of technology that robots are so popular as characters and as especially as villains and monsters. I think, um, as I said in an earlier episode about the zombie stories, I think there's a, a similar a similar kind of operative emotion or, or like maybe unconscious motivator in these kinds of things is, is, um, one of the great dilemmas in the modern world is like being, being tempted into 
uh, being a collectivist or being sucked into the collective so that you're just a, a, a cog in the works. You're just a brick in the wall. You're just another one of whatever category you, you fit into. And we, and we see people, I think year after year getting more and more obsessed of with wanting to put themselves in categories and erase their individuality and what kinds of monsters, uh, really showcase the dark side of that. In truth, there are plenty of, uh, of positive and good reasons to want to do that. Um, but what are the dark sides of that? I think in one side of it where we look at zombies as the dark side of it, another is the robot, uh, is this thing being created just to serve a purpose. Uh, so many people would say go to college just to be laborers rather than to be wise or knowledgeable. Um, so many people have jobs that aren't about creating something, but instead just following a certain kind of program or protocol, and more and more people might feel this sense of being a soulless machine. And it doesn't take very long before you get this feeling of, I need to rise up and fight back and do something about it. And so very often, I think a lot of us can relate to some of these robots, uh, that however terrifying they might be in some of our stories or films nowadays. And I think if we're going to get into like a narrative archetype of it, just uh, not like psychological archetype, Jungian, Jungian or anything, but like what types of characters are working in a story in what different ways. I don't see zombies and robots being all that different. And I think uh, Frankenstein's creation is is the image of the true bridge there. Maybe we'll talk more about that in the uh, in the Frankenstein episode. Okay, let's maybe let's get back to some more uh, robots that are really cool. Um, since we were starting so starting so early with a lot of these 18, 19, early 1900s ones, let's talk uh, for just a moment about an excellent story by Ambrose Bierce. Man, Ambrose Bierce was so ahead of his time, by the way. He could pick up any one of his stories and he's doing like really modern stuff in a really modern way. Uh, I think a lot of people might know his devil's dictionary, which is hilarious or, um, or occurrence at Owl Creek bridge, but he's got other, like these really cool monster stories. Uh, one we'll talk about in a later episode called the damned thing, but another one is Moxon's master. And it's about this guy who has created this chess playing robot. It's a whole lot like this chess playing automaton, the Turk from late 1700s. And that one's kind of famous, so you might have heard of this one in in history and in, in actual life, not in just in stories and literature. There was this automaton who had the turban and was styled to look like a like a Turk of the 16th century, and he would play chess and and at these ex, expositions or expo expos um, and these venues, people could come and watch him play chess or even challenge him to a chess game. Uh, famous people, uh, several famous people played the Turk because he was on tour for decades and decades and decades, um, starting in about 1770 or so. And for many, many decades, um, uh, Napoleon famously played him in a game of chess. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe even played him. Um, and it, eventually it was supposedly it was found out that it was never actually an automaton who was ab- able to play chess this well. It was actually just a little person in, in the robot play who was good at chess and, and was, and was, uh, using the gears and the kind of like a puppeteer inside the works to play chess. Um, but Ambrose Bierce wrote this story about this guy who made one, but it was a fully like autonomous robot just programmed to play chess and pretty short story what happens by the end well of course the robot rises up and kills his creator and his master and the narrator just happens to witness this bad timing the funny thing i think it's not funny in the story intentionally but i i think it's funny what causes this robot to rise up and like strangle his master with his iron hands as he has this calm contemplative face while he's murdering his master what causes him to do that is his master 
beat him in a game. He like gets a checkmate and screams about it and like and uh, and gloats about it. And the robot gets really mad about losing, turns over the table, and immediately kills him. And so robots are bad losers. Uh, keep that in mind if you plan on creating one and and playing against it. There are there are so many like famous robot you know, like killer monsters that fit this mold. I think perhaps um, in modern pop culture, the best image of that is the Terminator, um, which t- the first Terminator movie is really impressive. Like it holds up really well, so much so that Terminator 2, which was the big blockbuster of the 90s, uh, uh, you know, compared to the first one actually doesn't hold up as much as you might think. Uh, the first one is really good. Um, and so, but in, in that you have this, this slow footed, relentless, never stopping killer, just like the Gollum, just like original robots. And the backstory of course, is that the robots were created by people, but, um, for one reason or another, in this case, artificial intelligence and self-awareness, the robots rise up and they want to kill their creators with a little bit of time travel and changing that a little bit, but not too much. And so you have this in Terminator, essentially this, uh, this robotic skeleton coming after you and you might go, wait, wait, isn't that a cyborg, not a robot? Okay. So here's the quick differences. Uh, cyborg will be a cyber net it's short for cybernetic organism so you have uh and that's a pretty recent word too and so you have in that case a robot mixed with human and so a cyborg would be like part flesh have some type of human organs and then part robot in the terminator's case like his uh his um is covering his exoskeleton, I guess is, is flesh and endoskeleton is, is robotic. Um, uh, Robocop would be a cyborg, by the way. Um, an Android would be a robot specifically anthropomorphized, uh, specifically made to look and act like a, a human. So, say the star wars droids like c-3po would be an android because he's kind of made the gold one uh, who's kind of prissy and worried all the time neurotic i guess we should say he's a he's a he's an android but c-3po the one that looks like a little trash can is not an android he would just be a robot uh, one of these kind of autonomous machines So once you know that your fundamental robot story is essentially that after you create it, it will rise up and pursue you slowly and kill you uh, without any type of regret or remorse, without worrying about feeling pain. What do you do about it? Well, Isaac Asimov uh, created the laws of robotics, as he called them. And so that's caught on. And so much so that we don't even really associate robotics with the Asimov stories anymore. Um, by the way, Asimov, man, that not only did he have amazing sideburns, uh, but he was a, he was a strange genius. I think in the way that the original use of the word genius, like the spirit of the age, uh, he had, he had genius working in his mind and that he was one of these, I think the only writer ever to have a book published in every different category of the Dewey Decimal System. And uh, he's and he's uh, maybe specifically known, though, mostly for his fiction, um, even though he wrote all sorts of amazing things all over the place. His Guide to the Bible, by the way, is freaking fascinating and amazing. Um, but of his fiction, uh, one of his more famous books is I, Robot. These series of, it's like framed as an interview of one of these foundational inventors in this future that's wholly dependent on robots. Um, And it's a series of stories uh, told by this person being interviewed on at different eras of robotic development. And what ties everything together in the book, uh, other than the fact that it's all about robots, is 
that the original, what did he call it, the positronic brain of these robots were somehow built so that these rules could just not be violated. They were as there were three rules that were in the brain of every robot that could not be altered. They could not, except in one story, they were altered a little bit, um, but you couldn't get around them. They were as foundational as like a gravity on planet earth. The first of these rules is a robot can't harm a person. Uh, and and also a robot can't by inaction allow a human being to be harmed. The second is that a robot must obey any order given to it by a human as long as it doesn't violate the first rule. And so they're, they're numbered in priority, by the way. You got to follow the first one, and if you get past that point as the robot, then you have to follow the second, never once going back on the first. And the third of these rules, by the way, is the robot must not allow itself to be destroyed. So the third is self-preservation, unless it means action to prevent harm to a a human or unless it means uh, by some sort of order one would follow to to harm a human but also it means like if it were given an order that was about self-destruction that it would have to follow the order first because two was ranked higher than three and so with this kind of logic uh, all these stories play out as weird like puzzle piece scenarios where humans would be like imprisoned by these robots or like there would be this huge problem that you you've got to have a, you've got to communicate correctly to a robot to like have them prevent this huge disaster or mishap, but you can't get them working right and doing what you say. And it's a, it's a whole game of using these three puzzle pieces and logic to figure out, okay, in what way is the robot interpreting this as a number uh, one priority when we want it to be number three priority or vice versa type of thing. Um, and so it's a real, it's true science fiction in that it takes some scientific possibilities and it toys with knowledge and logic within the kind of precepts that it sets out that are kind of based on science and then plays with the fiction from there. So if you, so if you're into actually like a, like hard, uh, logical, maybe even a little bit dry, um, but real fundamental science fiction, and you haven't read iRobot, check that out. It's pretty cool. Uh, but it's not my favorite robot story uh, of recent years. I'll tell you one. I'm full on spoiler alert. So if you haven't yet watched a movie by Alex Garland called Ex Machina, then I think here's the time for you to sign off or pause on this podcast and wait and go watch that film or read the screenplay as well. It was nominated. I'm sure it was, had to be nominated. It's so freaking good. uh, I think it was nominated for best screenplay in the Oscars. And I'm pretty sure it won um, the other more reputable award shows uh, that um, for best screenplay, maybe even best picture of the year. Was that 2014, 15 something? It wasn't too many years ago. Um, This thing's awesome. So I want to talk about Ex Machina for a moment and I can't help but give stuff away. So here's the spoiler alert. And now here we go. This thing is so good. It's, uh, it's set in this, um, chateau that is uh in like the remotest parts of alaska you can only get there by helicopter and like these shipments uh from of equipment from china are shipped in and it's like this this uh, underground fortress of this guy this inventor who is essentially like if we mixed kind of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates all into one person. That's this main character, this uh, young guy who kind of invented the internet and Google and all these other things. And he's been by himself, kind of by himself and his, in his laboratory mansion. 
uh, making who knows what, and he's kept it under wraps. And then one like Charlie Bucket, lucky little golden ticket winner, one of these programmers that works for one of his companies gets to spend a weekend with this guy. And so it starts out with this, um, this, the perfect kind of setup, uh, mirroring a whole lot, uh, Jonathan Harker going to, uh, Count Dracula's castle for the first time, even the same kind of beats of like finding his way, uh, up the path to the door, getting inside, meeting Dracula's brides, uh, having the odd kind of interactions with, with the, the count, all that same kind of thing happens with this programmer meeting this great inventor who's makes you nervous from the start, but he's not like, like, st- like stiff and robotic as you might imagine. It's played so well. I can't remember the actor's name. Um, it, he's more like that. He plays this kind of, I don't know, bro douchebag kind of guy who just wants to be like hip and cool and drinks too much and wants to like party and and talk cool lingo but uh, you find out later that's a little bit of a ruse um he's created this robot uh this woman he calls ava and and he keeps her in this like glass cage and he wants his guest to go in and talk with her to see if this guest can be convinced that she's real. Uh, because that was one of the classic tests of true and artificial intelligence. If through conversation, you can't tell the difference between the robot and the hu- human, the real human, then that's uh, officially artificial intelligence. But this inventor is like in ex machina. He's like, I want to push it past that. I want you to see that she's a robot. And I, and I still think you'll be convinced that she's truly alive. And of course, this little kind of through the glass wall, this kind of love affair starts to happen or they, the young man starts to fall in love with a robot and you kind of are convinced that she's really starting to fall in love with him. And the more they're falling in love, the more you're seeing this inventor was kind of creating this these, uh, these female robots as these weird sex slaves. And he's a bit of a psycho. And the young guy's like, decides he has to break Ava out and she wants to escape and just wants to like live a normal girl's life. And, oh, but then when they're, when the plot thickens and they are finding their way to like dupe this genius in his own mansion and, and she gets out and then you realize the whole actual, once, once it's too late, you know, once the guys are kind of doomed and, and Ava is on her way out the 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 inventors kind of revealing like look yeah the whole thing was a setup uh i you didn't randomly get drawn out here um i was i created a rat and put her in a maze and i wanted to see how smart she could get how well she could learn could she find a way to escape and to use another human to escape? And so she was specifically designed to make you fall in love with her. And the young guy's like, there's no way that's not true. And you find out, of course, that now what you have on your hands is this terrifying kind of soulless killer. Uh, who, well, not a killer. She's just this terrifying soulless thing that just wants what she wants. And she finally gets out in the world and you know, a certain type of apocalypse is on its way. Oh, it's so good. I, I think the screenplay is as good as any uh, short story I've ever read. And the film is fantastic. I think I've gushed on this film enough, but, uh, but for now we'll just say it fits this kind of, uh, this this same type of story about robots we've been telling since the Gollum story, since the early 1920s robot stories, and it does it so amazingly well. I think uh, maybe a final statement about it is one of one of the many brilliant things that that story does. It's so simple, but it's so perfect. As a designer once said, if it's going to be simple, it has to be perfect, and that's that's what I admire so much about Alex Garland films. Um, but I guess one last thing I'll say that it does so well is that like reverses, uh, what happens with the uncanny Valley. I don't know if you've heard of the uncanny Valley before. I think those, uh, experiments or studies started in the 1970s 
these researchers would go out and find different people, different sexes, different ages, different cultures, different languages, try to get spread out as much as they could um, the sampling. And they would confront these people with non-human entities like trash can, like robots, like R2-D2. And they would uh, measure like how intimate the reaction, the interaction became or how long lasting it was, how positive that experience was. And then they would track it. They would uh, confront people with something more anthropomorphic, like an android, more like C-3PO like. And and then the uh, as predicted or as hypothesized, the the interactions were longer and more intimate, more positive and things were just getting better and better. They were becoming closer and closer friends, something a little bit closer to human. The interactions where you can imagine a graph kind of rising diagonally up and to the right. Um, and the closer it got to actual complete human, the more, uh, that the positive interaction would rise and rise until something weird happened until this thing, this non-human entity that they had real people interact with was really, really close to human, but not entirely like really close so much so that you thought it was human at first until you looked closely and you saw little telltale signs that, oh, this is not a thing with its own heart and soul and a and human mind of its own. It's actually a creation. The moment you got to something that close, then the reactions dropped off suddenly and people had a, a very visceral, negative, uh, um, rejective reaction to this thing. And the drop in the graph as they charted these reactions was a valley. And so they call this the uncanny valley, this uncanny reaction that was entirely negative. One of the coolest parts about the findings, they say, is that they were they were consistent across cultures, across languages, ages, sexes. It seemed to be a fundamentally human thing to react or extremely negatively to something that's really close to human, but not, even though we act, react so positively to anthropomorphize things that are not clearly not human. So, so was there something in our heredity in our instincts in our evolution that confronted us with things that were really close to humans, but not, and it was, it was in the interests of our survival to feel this visceral reaction against them. I mean, if you're an evolutionist, we, we have nothing that does not serve a purpose, right? And so there you have the fundamental need to recognize a monster posing as a human and to fight it and get away from it. And that's maybe the reason why you survived today is because your ancestors weren't being duped by demons, monsters, or ancient robots, or maybe not because, <laughs> because I think they, they tried to recreate those uncanny Valley studies more recently and they're not finding the same kind of data that the earlier studies did. Maybe it's because of all the CGI around now and everybody's just got, it just goes with it. Uh, or maybe the original studies weren't actually meticulous as they should have been. Who knows? It's pretty cool though. So I think more important than the actual findings is the concept of the uncanny valley and the closer it is uh, to truly human, but still not the more unnerving that is. I think that's, if nothing else, really useful for fiction writers when you're trying to create a monster that you really want to unnerve people. Um, a, a, gr a great example I use in my literature classes, by the way, is uh, um, uh, Joyce Carol Oates's masterpiece, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? That short story, Arnold Friend, is a, is a right in that uncanny valley. I think one of the creepiest villains in all of short stories. Um, so how about I do this as a sign off? If you want to see my take on a golem, believe it or not, He's in the Black Palace. I think he's one of the most lovable characters in that book. Um, so check out Moses the Gollum in my novel, The Black Palace. You might be, if you've followed along with this many episodes, you might be like, my God, does, does he have one of every monster in the Black Palace? Um, 
kind of just about every monster I can think of. I did each one of them my way. Um, so if, you, if you're into golems and you want to check that out, it's Amazon.com or also check out my website, joshwoodsauthor.com. If you've made it this far into the Monster Professor, congratulations for surviving. I'll talk to you next time on The Monster Professor. Monster Professor.